Hey everyone, this is Kevin. Welcome to another episode of Ableton Cast. Just a few quick shout outs. As always, got to say thank you so much to Recording Studio Rockstars podcast. Lidge, love what you do. Thank you for your support. Thanks to Tao Audio, Cherry Audio, and thanks to DrumSampleShop.com. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 32 of Ableton Cast and I am your host, Dan Garcia. I just want to start by saying massive thanks to Kevin for everything that you do to keep the podcast rolling. So, you know, you make my job super easy, which is great. Anybody watch the uh, Beatles documentary, Get Back yet? If you haven't, go and watch it. It's amazing. Uh, It's got nothing to do with Ableton, but it's just incredible and has made me super inspired. So... I think you should make that happen for yourself. Go and watch that. Uh, And our guest for this month is a producer by the name of Dan Giffen. Um, I had a wicked conversation with Dan about loads of stuff. Ableton and drums, obviously, we're both drummers, so common ground. um, And how we kind of use that in Ableton. Anyway, you'll hear it. Keep listening. Um, He produces under the artist's name Philia. Um, teaches Ableton Live through his website, which is liveproducersonline.com and hosts the podcast, Ableton Music Producer Podcast. So go and check that out. He's got some really, really cool stuff on there. And definitely go and check uh, Live Producers Online out. He has got some really cool stuff to give away, which we talk about later in the episode. Anyway, enjoy. Sweet, man. Well, thanks for coming on to Ableton Cast. Really appreciate it. I'm glad we got found the time to kind of make it happen, you know? Yeah, same here. I really appreciate you having me. Like I said, it's always good to hang out with another Dan, also another Ableton user. That doesn't happen very often. I haven't met I haven't met a lot of Ableton Dan's yet. Oh, uh, really? Uh, you're my third interview, so and you're my first Dan. So. Oh, well, I'm the first Dan. There you go. You're the first Dan. I feel yeah. special. So, why don't we start with like, uh, or I usually start with how you got started with music and how that led you to Ableton. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I've been using Ableton Live since like the beginning of version eight which was like 2013 or close to. Um, But yeah, I grew up in a tiny middle of nowhere town in Ohio called Van Wert. Shout out Van Wert. Most people go there to get gas as they're traveling through. But uh, yeah, and then um, I went to college in uh, Indiana at a private school, studied business. And I I grew up playing a lot of jazz drums. So I always had like a super musical family. My mom was like a professional like vocal coach for a lot of major artists and so like music was never really an option it was like what instrument are you gonna play kind of thing so i'm thankful for that and really got into electronic music and decided like i just looked online and was searching all these different daws and software that a lot of major electronic music up and coming people were using and uh, ableton live just kept popping up and i was like dope so i might have to check this out so I, I tried to download it and teach myself, and that didn't work very well. So I was like, I'm, I just need to go to school. Like, I don't want to waste my time on, like, YouTube, which was, like, the old YouTube back in the day. And, I mean, now there's, like, six billion tutorials. People can get started teaching themselves pretty easily. But So I just went to DubSpot, um, and this was, like, 2013 in um, New York City, which, RIP, DubSpot, it's not there anymore. Um, but it was like one of the really big foundational electronic music schools in the world at that time. Um, and I was able to learn from some brilliant certified trainers and uh, back in the prime of, of the school in New York City. Uh, I was really fortunate to be there at that time. And yeah, so I went through there. It was like a four and a half month Ableton certification. Um, it's like their own certification. It's not like the Ableton certified trainer thing. Uh, that's completely different. But yeah, I went to school there, ended up studying under Kiva. Um, he's a brilliant, brilliant Ableton certified trainer, a bunch of others. Um, yeah, then I was planning on staying, but ran out of money because anybody who's ever been there knows it's stupid expensive. So I uh, was going to have a roommate and he backed out last minute. So I was like, well, shit, I guess I'm going to have to go home. So I, I moved back to Indianapolis uh, where my family relocated, uh, which I'm at the time being now. And yeah, just became known as that Ableton guy. Like friends would be hitting me up and be like, hey, you want to give me some free lessons because we're friends? And I was like, sure. And just like nerding out and hanging out with people. And then I was like, you know, I could probably make money off of this. I have enough people hitting me up. Maybe I should just start charging for this. And so I did. 
And uh, yeah, then I, I found out about Ableton user groups, which is really cool. Anybody listening, I mean, if you feel like you aren't connected or plugged into a community of other like-minded Ableton users, then um, on Ableton.com, there's a website you can find user groups uh, in a lot of major cities around the world. So you might find one near you. It's a great way to get plugged in to the local scene. Obviously, COVID is still kind of a thing, but you know, there's still online resources happening with user groups as well. If you can't meet in person or if your user group person's not meeting, or even if you start one, you can totally start one, which is what I did. Um, and I just hit up Ableton. I was like, I'd love to start a user group. And they were really supportive of doing that. And uh, yeah, so they ran a couple of Facebook ads and started doing like a really chill meetup and we had like really it was a terrible first meeting like <laughs> i ended up i had a projector that barely worked and we had like maybe six, like six people show up and uh like this the audio was terrible the speaker was blown and we met in a, like an old coffee shop after hours <laughs> uh, but it, it grew and we ended up averaging like say 25 to, to 30 people every time we met at least and uh after a year of doing it so that was really cool to see that grow and just kind of being a part of the local scene, uh, which I've been in Indy now for about six years. So that's been really fun to, to have that community and, and whatever. So encourage people to check out user groups on Ableton.com if they haven't and get plugged in. Um, there's a lot of Facebook groups as well. If you just want to do a quick search on there, you might find it. But yeah, long story short or shortish. I, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I landed where I'm at now. And I became an Ableton certified trainer in 2020, January, 2020, right before COVID. Um, and that was, that was a wild, fun experience. Um, so I'm an Ableton certified trainer now. And even a year before that, 2019, I was fortunate to study with uh, Laura Eskede, who was the first Ableton certified trainer in the world. And she does what's called playback, which is really helping major label artists on huge tours set up rigs and work with their tracks for live performance, which could be anything from just hitting play and playing back a couple stems to being really involved with their rigs and running automatic bank changes for MIDI controllers and being really involved to basically accomplish the dream of the artist to perform however they want on stage. Uh, so she taught me a lot of her playback systems and she came up with like Kanye and has done work with Ariana Grande and The Weeknd and all those artists. So yeah, I've been really blessed to be able to learn from her team as well. Yeah. That's amazing, man. What a cool story. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And then obviously yeah. I, I started my podcast, which is a big part of how we ended up meeting. Uh, yeah, of course. Was yeah. I started my Ableton Music Producer podcast two years ago for my students because I teach online as well now, but I was also teaching at multiple recording studios here in Indianapolis, uh, which is also where I was able to meet Mac Miller and a lot of other people and teach them little Ableton tricks and tips as artists were touring through uh, The Lodge, which is a studio that I was teaching at. Um, and then, yeah, the podcast was just like, here's something the students might enjoy, me talking in a microphone aimlessly about things I'm learning with Ableton and music production. Um, and then it just kind of stuck. And I was like, I wonder who else I could actually get on the podcast. So I just started aiming really high and was surprised. And just now it's a thing. So Yeah. Well, from what I found is people are so generous with their time with podcasts. They're yeah. like, people are just happy to chat. And it's really easy to get high caliber guests such as yourself. You know, it's like. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, know? it really is. And it's good marketing, you know, as you slowly build an audience. It, it doesn't cost too much to just give 45 minutes an hour of your time and uh, just, you know, be, being able to spread that awareness to new audiences and meeting new people. And yeah, I've met a lot of people through the podcast. It's been really fun. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? It's such mm -hmm. a cool thing to do. Tell me about uh, your website. Is it Live Producers Online? Yeah. So yeah. Tell, tell people about that and the work you do there. Well, as I was leaving that studio I was at before, um, I was really thinking about, okay, there's a lot of people who take my my six-month Ableton class and then they end up having more questions later. So that's kind of how it started. Um, and just uploading video tutorials and content and wanting to be able to own that rather than just upload it to YouTube for free, um, which I still do. I have a lot of content up there for free on YouTube. But, um, you know, just being able to have a membership where I could really uh, be able to like interact with my audience and have more control um, so I started the website with that intention, um, and I have a master class, and then I have also a membership for people can join and just 
kind of learn at their own pace. So yeah, and then podcast is kind of integrated with that as well. So yeah, that's kind of the website. That's what's going on. Sweet, that's awesome. That's really cool, man. Um, okay, so talk us through how you use Ableton. I'm kind of aware that you use it live and in the studio, right? You use it in both yeah. worlds, is that correct? Yeah. I'm, do you want to do uh, studio world first? Yeah, totally. I mean, I I don't know how deep you want to get. I feel like I could go in a lot of different directions. but um, Go deep, go deep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Live 11 is really cool. I've been having a lot of fun with that since it came out. Um, yeah, uh, there's just, I mean, there's a lot of ways we can go with this. I'm, I know you sent me a list of questions and things before we met, and maybe we could fire through some of that. Like you were asking me some of my favorite Ableton stock plugins. Um, drum bus. I don't know if you want to go there. We can. We can nerd out about yep. that. Yeah, um, yeah, let's do it. Like as far as mixing kind of stuff, I, I mean, I do all my producing and mixing and mastering in Ableton Live. Um, I have an M1, the new Apple computer, um, which I love, and it can handle a lot. So I haven't been doing as many stem mixes as I used to, like bouncing out all the audio. I had a good conversation with uh, Kate Watson. She's an Ableton certified trainer recently. That's the that episode's releasing tomorrow. But she, uh, she and I talk about stem mixing, and uh, I do all my stuff in Ableton. But yeah, drum bus is probably one of my favorite mixing effects. I mean, creating a group and then just running all my drums through that. Or even using it on like piano or vocals. Like I know it's called drum bus, but man, I use that thing on everything. It's just like yeah, it's like icing on the cake every time. It's beautiful. Um, Sweet. The glue compressor is really nice too, and um, I love using that on not even just groups, but even individual tracks as well. And um, if you turn on soft clip, the soft clip button, and you crank up the makeup gain, it, you can turn it into a saturator. So it'll it'll distort things like really well. Um, and so if you want to really saturate or drive a distortion in, into an instrument and also compress it at the same time, that's a really great way to do it. Um, and then just turn down the track volume really at that point because you're going to make it a lot louder. So turn on that soft clip and try not to blow your ears cranking up that makeup gain. Um, color limiter, while talking about compression stuff, that's a really nice device. I feel like a lot of people sleep on that, but it, uh, it has like a warm analog kind of sound to it. So yeah, as, a, as a, an alternative to the glue compressor or even uh, Ableton's stock limiter, the color limiter is really nice. Nice. Um, That's wicked. Yeah. yeah. It's a, a trick I learned, I don't know, a couple of years ago is with the EQ8 and the glue compressor that I mentioned. If you right click on it, you can turn on oversampling, um, mm -hmm. which. I'm not going to go too deep into oversampling because I don't know enough about it, to be honest with you, but um, it, it can yield like a better sound and result with um, playing back the frequencies at like a higher range. Um, so like instead of playing back at like 12,000 hertz, it could be like 24 or not. Yeah, like 24,000 hertz. Um, so like basically having a higher range. But yeah, oversampling, if you right click on the device, you can turn that on, that's a good time. Um, the OTT, love the OTT. It's a preset of the multiband dynamics. It's just like an instant happy, happy device. Like you just throw it on there, it just makes everything sound more in your face, a little bit brighter. Oh, Co nice. Of course you can overdo yeah. it and then everything's just white noise and fuzzy. But yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you're going for that, it's a good time. Nice. Um, That's quality, man. And do you use that on kind of general instruments, like it, or uh, some of those things, like specific to drums or specific to keys or guitars, or is it just like those are kind of just good? I mean, I use it literally on everything. That's and that's a good, that's a hard question, and um, I don't know if there's a perfect answer because I, I feel like music production is so subjective, right? Yeah, like it's not it's not necessarily a one size fits all type of approach for me personally and a lot of people I know. It's a lot of just like, there's all these different tools and audio and MIDI effects and stuff that Ableton Live gives you. And it's really just a matter of like using your ears on a case by case scenario to problem solve what you really need to accomplish. And so um, 
I think having a good idea of like the foundations of mixing is like really helpful um, for a lot of producers, especially starting out. But I'm even looking at myself now, like I learned at DubSpot, that school in New York I was talking about, like Daniel Wyatt is a multi-platinum Grammy engineer, mastering engineer, and he's brilliant. And I was lucky to study under him. And um, he taught me a lot of really important things that have helped me a lot with my mixes. But I'm also finding I'm having to unlearn some of those things because- Oh, really? Yeah, because like I think music is like so subjective in a lot of ways that like I'm finding myself, I have more fun when I'm like sometimes not even really thinking about what I'm doing, like more so with sound design. It's like, how can I take the sound and make it more inter interesting by just throwing a ton of effects on it and then just turning knobs until I get like a really interesting result. And it's like, I would have maybe never have done that if I was taking a more traditional safe approach to like how I'm producing. And now I'm more under like the school of thought. It's like, let's see how weird I can make stuff like sound. And, uh, right, and, there's, okay. and, and there's like an intention behind that too, right? Like, cause yeah. I'm making like experimental bass music stuff. If I was just making like a country or a pop track, you know, then maybe I would have a different approach. But yeah, but um, yeah, I think having a basic mixing foundation is super helpful. I think that kind of you know speaks to the kind of like it's good to have all these like weapons in your arsenal, so to speak. So if you want yeah. that thing, you do that technique, or if you want to go weird, you do it this way. Or it's just like put things to pull from and ways to go yeah. depending on what you want rather than like oh this is a kick drum so I have to do this right kind of thing exactly yeah. yeah and go back to going back to your question with the OCT like one prime example is like say there was a piano I was playing with on a track I'm working on the other day um, and the piano wasn't very bright and it felt like it was kind of pushed in the background of the mix and so I threw an OTT on it and then I just turned up the output game and I pulled back the dry wet mix to like 30% and it really fixed that for me because I knew that would happen, right? Right, so yeah. That's one use case, I guess, yeah. of it. Yeah, so like, yeah, exactly. Like knowing your knowing your tools and how to get what you need out of them is super mm -hmm. important. Totally. That's, what, that's, that's quality. Yeah. That's really cool. Auto pan's really fun too. I love auto pan. Um, for not even just panning, but for like side chaining or creating like a pumping effect. If you pull down the uh, phase to zero, then you can use the amount as a volume knob for it gating in and out, like almost like a side chain effect. I've been having fun with that lately too. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, auto pan still. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And then I suppose like while we're here, like any third party plugins that you use a lot. Yeah, I have to give a shout out for Echo and Hybrid Reverb because I feel like those are two of my probably most used devices as far as like a reverb and a delay. Um, so I want to say that before we go on. But yes, that, those are really cool. Um, like third party plugins and instruments, I would say as far as instruments go, like Arturia, I don't know if you've played with much Arturia stuff. I haven't played with much of oh, that, man. but... I, I know that it. it's a lot of people use it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. There's um, the Arturia V collection. It has like a bunch of real analog sounding synths and keyboards. and So anybody who's looking to expand that library, check out Arturia. Uh, disclaimer, they actually sponsored the podcast, so I should probably say that. <laughs> but <laughs> shout, shout out to Arturia as well. <laughs> yeah, but they make good stuff for sure. Um, like as far as instru other instruments I use, like Vital is really cool, it's free. Uh, you basically just pay for the presets, which is a really interesting business model, I feel like. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Very similar to Serum. Do you pay per preset? It's a subscription. Yeah. So, like, I think it's every week. I think it's every, like, seven days. He sends you, like, another bundle of presets that just, like, automatically install. Um, I think you just have an internet connection. You just, like, open up the plugin and just... And it'll just do its yeah, thing. yeah. Um, wow! Really interesting business model. Yeah, that is really interesting. Yeah. So, what does that plugin do? It's very similar to Serum. It's a wave okay. wavetable synth. Uh, it's very very similar to Serum, um, and obviously cheaper if you want to get started. And there's um, there's a really cool website. Uh, it's called Free VST, I think it is. Um, what is it? Free? I'm gonna look that up if you don't mind. Yeah, no, do it. That's great. Uh, yeah, it's like where you can buy and sell 
VSTs. Oh man, I'm gonna have to find that out. I think, yeah, it is a freevsts.com, I think it is. But you can just download a ton of, of presets. Um, the, what, what is, is it like a community type forum yeah, thing where people yeah, just exactly. upload their presets and you can just kind of have them? Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, I mean, I can't remember right now. I'm going to find it. I'll send it to you after we hang out. Yeah, but yeah, send, send it to me after. Maybe you can put it in the show notes. But yeah, I found it on yeah. Reddit the other day, and it's got a ton of like serum presets and other stuff that all these users are uploading. Oh, uh, nice. I'll find that later. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds super cool. Um, mm. Yeah, but then uh, I guess like other plugins, Fresh Air is a free one by Slate Digital. And I just downloaded that for the first time last night and was playing with it. I've had students, other people tell me I need to check it out. It basically, it's like a combination of like a soft saturator with an EQ that like boosts a high shelf. So it makes everything a little like brighter. Um, and then it also has like, I don't know, some kind of technology reducing harsh frequencies at the same time. So it, it's called Fresh Air and it, it sounds exactly like what the name is it just makes everything sound a little cleaner and brighter um the stuff from slate is great yeah yeah and then um i'd also say probably my most used and favorite plugin just for making stuff instantly sound good especially if there's like a harsh frequency and you can't really find it and you're trying to tame it uh soothe 2 by uh oix sound is really good yeah you're the uh, second person to recommend that one. Yeah, man. <laughs> Sooth 2 yeah. is really dope. It just It's an instant fix, really, and so easy to use. Um, a lot of times I don't even really play with it too much. I just throw it on there, and a lot of times it's it's already done. Um, wow. Yeah, it makes it <laughs> yeah, way that's cool. feels like cheating. It's nice. Yeah, yeah, it's a cheat code. <laughs> it is, total cheat code. Yeah. Um, there's also... Probably one of the most interesting and useful ones I found recently for live performance is um, Mixed In Key. They make a studio, they make a live uh, plugin, which is their newest one. It just came out. It's called Mixing Key Live. And if you're a DJ and you're looking to organize like a set list of songs, you install it in your computer and instantly anything that's playing through your sound card, whether it's in Ableton Live or whether it's on Spotify or SoundCloud in your browser, it automatically listens and it'll give you a really quick readout within like four or five seconds of the BPM and the key that that song is in. So that's also good for individual samples. Say you download a sample pack, right? And it doesn't actually give you the key that the sample's in. You can just drag that individual sample into Mixed In Key Live. I think it's like 59 US dollars. Um, it's not too expensive. And it, you can drag the actual file into it and it does the same thing. Um, That's yeah. so cool. It's really, so really clever. useful stuff. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I love that. Shout out to Mixed in Key. They're a great company too. I love the people that work there. Um, but then they also have a Mixed in Key Studio Edition, which is a plugin that you could run inside of Ableton. And you could put it on your master or an individual track. And it'll tell you what key um, that sample or whatever's being played in or this track. And even to go even a step further, it has like another view. It has like a key view and a note view. Um, and the note view will show you all the different um, like frequency ranges that are being spiked. So it'll show you like like the root of this, say like stereo piano is like playing these notes and it'll show you exactly like what's being played in the frequency range. It's really cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Wicked. So, those are probably my top picks in the plugin world. Yeah. I could, I could probably talk another 12 hours about plugins, yeah. but... <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of them out there. It's, it's a deep world. So, so many. Yeah. So many. Yeah. Um, let's move sort of over to, to the live side of things and how you utilize Ableton out live. What kind of thing do you use it for? And yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a loaded question. So when I perform live as Philia, uh, P-H-I-L-I-A, um, I've had that project for about three years now. Feels longer than that. But it's been about three years since I started that project. And it started out with me just DJing, which I do more of now than I have been the last two years. I ended up 
stealing two bandmates from two other bands uh, locally, and I was like, "Hey, you guys are really good. I want I want you to play with me instead." So I, <laughs> I kind of stole them, but uh, a saxophonist and a keyboardist, and then I also play live acoustic drums mixed with electronic drums, and and then I also play a push two and a APC forty. Right. Um, that's my live setup. Uh, Do you run I, your drum electronics through Ableton? No, I don't actually. I used to, but I found that building a drum rack with multiple sources of audio that I was monitoring inside of Ableton Live was like taxing my computer. Um, usually when I'm performing, I don't want that little CPU meter in the top right corner to ever go past like 30%. I feel safer when it's just below 30 or 40 at most. So when you're running a lot of live audio through Ableton, it's taxing the CPU quite a bit. So um, I try to minimize how much I'm actually triggering real time with live audio being monitored. Um, so I actually use an SPDSX drum pad. Um, yeah. You actually see it, it's right over here. Yeah. Here it is. Oh, there you go. That so I'm ready to go. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, that's my baby. And I, I can actually import samples into the brain of it. So then I'm just running mono out of that into my Apollo interface, my universal audio Apollo interface. And then um, I'll turn on the monitoring in the interface. So it's actually never going through live. Um, and then as far as routing stuff goes, um, hopefully I explain this pretty well, but I have return tracks set up. And then I have one dedicated return track for my in-ears. And then I have another dedicated return track for the band um, for their in-ears. So I can create a custom custom mix with individual tracks and in the sends going into the return tracks for whatever I want us to hear on stage. So if the keyboardist needs more um, stem of you know, vocals or backing tracks or whatever, I can send him more of that or more click, whatever he needs or himself. And then my setup's really kind of unique because I'm actually playing and DJing the band as they're playing. Um, so for example, like the keyboardist at the end of a song, I can go over to my APC 40 and I'll run him through like a, like Valhalla Shimmer or a special reverb just to have like this really big outro sound of him playing a pad or something, right? Or run him through like a, I use a crystallizer, like Sound Toys is crystallizer, it's a really cool plugin. I try not to use a lot of plugins in my live set, but those are two that I really love. And then I'll put, I'll like play the band basically. Um, wow. So that's awesome, man. That's so cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot of trial and error. I've definitely yeah. fucked up on stage quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> but, have to just roll with that, though. Yeah, it happens. Oh yeah, yeah. totally. A lot of trial. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then my actual. St so I have a interesting, unique setup where I have a standing drum set. Um, so I, I actually don't play the kick drum because I found with the music I've produced, I, I mix between playing original songs that I've made and then other songs that I'm DJing basically with the band playing on top of sometimes if I'm with the band, unless I'm playing solo. Yeah. And that's like a whole nother mixing hurdle that I have to get over because I don't necessarily have the ability to take out the kick drum of other tracks that I'm DJing. And so I could do that for my own songs, but if I'm playing, say, an hour and a half set, then it would be really strange for me to be playing a live kick and then transitioning into other songs that didn't have that same sonic energy with the bass. So I just don't play kick drum. Um, and I'm playing standing up on my drums. Uh, but I still have like real cymbals and I have a snare and a hi-hat and then my SPD drum the SPD, pad. Yeah. 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 Uh, sometimes I'll use real toms if I don't mind carrying a bunch of extra stuff. But I get a pretty good workout carrying that by myself. Trigger, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Do you ever trigger your snare? Um, no, I don't because a lot of times I'm actually playing my snare drum on top of other existing snares in the track. So... I don't really need to add a ton of extra layers because usually that layer is already there baked into the song I'm playing on top of. Um, but I, I do actually tighten my snare really tight um, because I don't need a lot of bottom end. I just want more of that top end snap playing on top of the snare. 
And then it's just a balance of really trying to be really in time, which just comes with a lot of practice because you could, if you're hitting a really tight snare on top of a snare already mastered into a song, it can sound like a weird flam kind of sound. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just a lot of practice, I guess, when it comes to that. But yeah, but yeah, that's that's the live setup. That's uh, really cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I, I do, perform mostly. Sorry, in, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say I perform mostly in session view now. Although I I performed in arrangement view as well, and that's how Laura actually does it. She a lot of times will play in arrangement view. But my and there's a like a lot of people that debate right like which view is better for live performance, and honestly I say it doesn't matter because you can literally do almost anything you can imagine in either view with the help of Max for Live, which I've done. So yeah, I just know with the new uh, scene follow actions, which I heard Elephant on your podcast talk about. Yeah, uh, I forget his actual name, but he's he produces as Elephant. Super nice guy. He, uh, yeah, he talked about scene follow actions, and so I was, I, um, I definitely use that too. I love that. It's a great live eleven update. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. What was the reason for the switch? Um, I think that was big part of it. Um, another one of my biggest issues with performing live was in arrangement view. It's easy to automate tempo changes. Um, and in session view, that's not always been the case. Um, if I was to play one song, I usually have my song set up in scenes. So each row is triggering a bunch of clips. And when I wanted to jump to the next scene, I would have to manually change the BPM, the tempo. And there were times when I didn't always have the capacity to do that if I'm playing drums at the same time, right? Unless I grew a third arm. And so I was... Uh, I was doing some research and I found uh, Tempo 2 is a Max for Live device and you can throw it on any track. Um, I just put it on a MIDI track and then I can create like a dummy clip and put it in that scene that I'm changing to. And so when I play that next scene um, or if I have a scene follow action that does it for me, then it triggers that clip with Tempo 2 on it and then I can set in Tempo 2, okay, over the next seven or eight seconds or whatever, I want uh, to change the tempo from whatever this is to this BPM. So it can do that for you really easy as far as like smooth tempo changes in session view from scene to scene. Does that use Ableton's cl native click? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just yeah, changing, cool. yep. Um, yeah. But that is a Max for Live device, I think it's like it's like five bucks or something. It's not much. Oh, yeah, wow. It's yeah, five dollars. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Have you ever tried using, because Ableton 11 now has the follow tempo thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can make its click follow a live source. Yeah. Have you ever experimented with that? Not live. I haven't played with it live, but it is really cool. And I'm glad you brought that up because um, when Live 11 first came out, I was like, I wanted to push that and see how well it could really work. So I went on YouTube and I routed in to uh, Live's input a bunch of videos of like street drummers like playing together. And the audio wasn't even that fantastic, but it did a really good job of like keeping in time and um, not jumping around too much, which I thought was really impressive for like a YouTube video of some street drummers playing without a click, obviously. They weren't playing to a click. Yeah. And, and it slowly started like... Just it was it stayed within like a three or four BPM range, but it was very slow. It moved like perfectly, and I was playing the click with it, and I was really surprised how how smooth it was. It was very nice. It that's works. really cool. Yeah, because yeah. I've I haven't had the chance to try it yet. Because you're I, a drummer, right? You you play I drums. Am. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I uh, I often run backing tracks and run my electronics through Ableton. Okay. But I'd love to try running it with like, with kind of, so I automate all my, like often automate samples on and off throughout the song. So my snare, whatever's on my snare changes in the chorus or whatever. Yeah. I'd love to try it where it just follows me and we're not actually tied to a tempo. Yeah. So when you get to the end of the song, you can be a bit faster. Yeah. Or do you know what I mean? It can just be a bit more human and mm -hmm. add that 
that more live performance to it. Totally. I really, really want to get stuck in with that. I'm working with an artist right now, and I think there's a song in their set that it would be like perfect for. Cool. We just haven't got time to get it together for the show. Yeah. Yeah. Let me know how that goes. That sounds really yeah, cool. Um, I, I know that there's other drummers that would really benefit from that, especially playing like, like jazz and that kind of stuff. Because I mean, a lot of times those cats, they're not even playing to a click. They're just feeling it out as they go, right? So I could see for certain genres, I feel like that would be super helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I think it, that's, that's one of the most exciting things about Eleven for me. Okay. It's the potential that actually you could run clicks out live that aren't clicks. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not like yeah. we're staying here. <laughs> would you? What a microphone would you use that on? Would it be for like your snare drum or like? I don't know. That's the thing. It's like I was. I've been debating about you throwing up like a, a specific mic, like mm -hmm. a crotch mic yeah. position, because then it would pick up the kick and the snare quite evenly. Yeah. yeah. But I think it would depend on the part as well that you're playing. If it's like. Mm. If it's a super driven kick drum part, then maybe the kick would be fine. I think that would need some experimentation, yeah, and just like try stuff, see what see what it responds better to. Right, it would have to be some kind yeah. of directional mic, I would imagine. Otherwise, it could pick up monitors and other stuff, background noise, um, depending yeah. on the, the venue. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. first place to try it is in my studio on my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good start. Step one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then take it into the rehearsal room with the band and see what happens. I don't yeah. know. I, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be. It's got potential. I was just talking to uh, Billy Eilish's drummer the other day. Oh, Andrew. Andrew, yeah, super nice guy. He was uh, talking on the podcast about a bunch of different drum hardware and things he was using. Uh, we, we nerded out pretty hard. It was really fun. He was talking about the, um, it's called Porter and... Porter and Davis. Davis, yeah, with their... <laughs> the drum stool. Drum stool, yeah. That's Have like, you tried it? I haven't, but it sounds oh, cool. Oh, man, they're amazing. So yeah. um, I'll just do a quick explanation for anybody listening who doesn't know what it is. Yeah. Porter and Davis drum stools are a tactile monitoring system where you take a signal from your bass drum and you plug it into the brain of the Porter and Davis, and then it has it splits the signal. So you can send it to front of house, and it works passively, so it doesn't ruin the signal. And then through a speaker on cable, you plug it into the seat. So when you hit your kick drum, you physically feel it. Yeah. And from my experience, when you're running in-ear monitors, it's it changes everything. Yeah. It changes everything, and you can. Uh, I think it's there. I have the Gigster, which has one input, but I think it's the BC2 has two inputs. So if yeah. you're running electronics, you can actually just run your electronic lows and your um, acoustic kick without having to like mess around with the sound engineer. Essentially, sending you sending you another monitor. Yeah. Send. Yeah. But they are they change. In my experience, it changes the way I play live. Yeah, like, that's very cool. You're so much more responsive. And then you're not getting battered by this sub. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and that can that's the worst way to play if you can't hear very well your kick drum as a drummer. Because that's like yeah. the, that's the anchor of the song, right? Especially yeah. with dance music of any kind. Yeah. Yeah. So hearing your yeah. kick drum, I feel like, is one of the hardest things for drummers using in-ear monitors. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's huge. And it keeps, like on top of that, if you're playing a smaller venue, it keeps the stage sound clean. Yep, you know, you you. It's just the guys that invented it are genius. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not even so that cool. It's not even that crazy of an idea, really. No, I think Pearl did it like a like one that you could like bolt onto your seat. You could like clip it to the to the like st uh, the okay the, the legs of the throne. Yeah, and you could do it that way, but it's not as effective. They also have for anybody that doesn't play drums out there, they also have a, like a bass plate which is I call it a bass plate it's just a plate that you stand on and then you play and it comes through okay yeah, so I know uh, a lot of keyboard players use that yeah so and they can feel the low end on their keys it's have you ever played with the sub pack no oh do you know what a sub pack is is that the one that you wear yeah I actually have one do you have one I do I don't know how well you can see it. it's on this chair it's really hard to see it's a black chair but oh it's, yeah, it's I think the, you can see it. Yeah, it's got this little hand thing on it. Yeah. It's brilliant. Um, it's basically, I think it plays below 250 hertz, but it's uh, it's 
what it's tactile based monitoring. So you actually feel it. Um, and you just lean against your chair and you put it on the back seat of your chair. They also have a Bluetooth one that's a book bag you could wear, um, but you feel the bass. Um, and it's also oh, wow. blue, it's Bluetooth, um, but you can also run it. Like I have a um, PreSonus monitoring station. And so I just run aux out into my chair um, and I have it strapped on there and I can really feel the relationship between the kick and the bass, which is really helpful for mixing because I can feel exactly how loud my kick and my bass are. Um, and then just referencing it with other track is like a game changer for dialing in low end. Yeah, that's some, I never thought about that and like using it in the studio. Oh, totally. That's I, so cool. I love it for the studio, but you also yeah. have these guys in big arenas playing big tours that use them too. Yeah, I think I've got a friend who has one actually, and he prefers it over the Porter and Davis. Really? So, yes, yeah. some people really love them. Yeah. Yeah, but they're yeah. coming out with a new one um, pretty soon. It's like the S2, I think it's called. Uh, yeah, but there's they're kind of hard to order because it seems like they're always out of stock. I think maybe oh, really? everybody, everything, everybody just loves them. Everybody's got the, yeah, yeah. Found, found out what they are and then mm -hmm. needs them. Yeah, because yeah. I, when I first heard of the Porter and Davis, I was like, Really? Come on. Like <laughs> nobody needs that. And then I played one and was like, like I'm I, buying one right now. Yeah. Like I've got yeah. to get one. Yeah, they're so cool. It's be the nicest so, butt massage you'll ever have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, awesome. Do you have any do you ever run backing tracks before I ask the next question? Otherwise it's irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You do. Um, okay, sweet. When I'm playing with my band, I do. Um and there's like a couple reasons. So I create like a separate Ableton Live project where I have all my mastered stems. And then I'll usually go through there and say, okay, these are like maybe cuts I want to do. Maybe I want to mute this clip here and do these changes or whatever. Maybe cut out the verse chorus. And then I'll bounce that usually as a stereo track um, and turn off like dithering 16 bit wave file. And then I'll import that and adjust the clip volume, usually to other tracks that I'm DJing that I didn't make, right? If I do that. Um, so, yeah, and I use a I use a Max for Live device called Swiss Army Meter, which measures the LUFS, L-U-F-S, uh, loudness units full scale, which measures a lot of different types of loudness. A lot of mastering engineers use. So that's how I balance my tracks in my Ableton Live set. Um, and I'll just adjust the clip volume of each clip to match each other's loudness. So when I'm playing, there's nothing worse than maybe you've been at a club and you hear the transition from one song to another and it's just like one is stupid loud and it's like hitting you in the face. So yeah, being able to balance the volumes is really important as well. So that's another thing. Um, that's really, really useful to know. Because like that's something I always spend ages doing is just making sure that like the individual stems are going to be consistent throughout yeah. the set. Yeah, Swiss um, Army meters is fast. I don't even have to listen to it. I just look at the readout. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'll always measure like the loudest part of the song. So I'll go straight to the drop and I'll just listen to it there for about five to ten seconds and then just watch it and um, try to bounce usually everything to about minus ten, minus nine luffs. It's usually my happy place um, just because that gives like a little extra room at minus 10 for other things to be played on top of to have a little bit of just a little bit of headroom but making everything still loud enough for the club do you do that before you put it into the playback session or into the session so you, you yes you do the swiss army thing before and then when it's in in the ableton session it's done mm -hmm. yeah and there's a couple reasons why i'll i'll hit it with a limiter um, because if you're mastering a song, I'm trying to make sure I say this right. If I'm mastering a song and I get the stems back from a mastering engineer or I master the stems, usually you back off the limiter because if you're soloing individual tracks that you're exporting and you're having that limiter on the master that's hitting all of them equally as hard, they're all going to come out way louder than the actual final mastered track. So typically backing off the limiter when you're doing a, a final stem master bounce, so with all the individual tracks, 
And then you get those tracks and I put them in say a new project to do those cuts and edits and things. Um, then I'm going to have to hit it with that limiter again to bring it all back up with all the dynamics. Back. Yeah. To make sure those yeah. dynamics are still hitting as if they were in the original mastered project. Um, so right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's really cool. Yeah. I, I was, I mean, you've already answered the question I was going to ask. I was gonna say, uh, <laughs> do you have any tips for, for prepping stuff for a live show? But that's like what an answer that yeah. is. It's amazing. Actually, so, it's, yeah. it's good question i literally just came back from st louis uh, missouri and taught at one of the first ableton user group events that they've had um since covid actually it was the first one back um and the whole entire thing was about djing and performing live um so i have actually all my notes and my live project if anybody wants to download that um there's my presentation notes and my ableton live template um, if you want to download it, just go to liveproducersonline.com slash DJ template and you can download that. Oh man, that's very kind of you. That's, and I include, quality. I include a lot of links and stuff um, to like certain devices that I use. Like one other really fun device is like you, you probably already know this for sure, um, but just to be able to prevent my computer from crying on stage is if you have a lot of instrument racks or devices that have, say, plugins or things that you're not using in real time that can still eat up your CPU and make your computer want to cry a little bit. So there's uh, one of my good friends, uh, Masinki. He and I did a track together. He's a brilliant uh, trumpet player. And he created a Max Live device called mm.chain per scene. So if you're performing in session view, and you jump from one scene to the next, there, he created an instrument rack that you can drop on there and you can load on this instrument rack all the instruments you want to play live. And then as you change scenes, you can automate it so it'll automatically turn off every device in an instrument rack that's not being used. So you don't have to do each one individually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which That's is so cool. And I think he, he's got like up to 16 instrument racks in a set thing that he made. So you just drag it onto a MIDI track and you just pull in, say, like a, a instrument that you use or plug in that you use into those chains. And then it's only going to play back one of those chains at a time. Um, wow. Which is, so you could, you could everything. have your, sorry, yeah. You could, you could have your 10 song set list, put all the devices in each one. And mm -hmm. then it'll only play one at a time. When you flip to the next song, the other nine are all mm -hmm. switched off. Yeah. That's so clever. Yeah, it's really brilliant. That's I so mean, cool. and you could totally do that anyway, but it would take a lot of extra programming because you'd have to yeah. go in and automate every single scene with a dummy clip to turn on and off stuff. Yeah. So for every single device right. or plug in, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's really, really yeah, cool. Yeah, he's brilliant. That's a Love that proper guy. hack, that one. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Nice. Oh, there's also. Um, as a drummer, I, do you ever play with an SPD, a Roland SPD? Uh, I I do. I have this weird thing where I hate the way they look <laughs> <laughs> on stage. Like it's completely irrational. Um, That's funny. So I have done in the past, and I have one, and I've used it a bunch. Um, yeah. But I just think, it, like in twenty twenty one, they're just kind of so obvious. It's like, oh, yeah, you've got an SPD. Everybody so has I'm one. I'm now yeah. like. I now use a Roland TM6C, like the old MIDI converter things. Oh yeah. Just have used, uh, do you know those? Yeah, I have one. Yeah, yeah, they're they're awesome. Yeah, they are. Yeah, so I just use one of those okay. instead. With the triggers. <laughs> I just with the triggers. Yeah. 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 And, but yeah, sorry, you were saying to, no. Like, what were you going to say? It's, yeah. I don't even remember. Oh, oh yeah, I do. Um, I was gonna say for the SPD SX that you like you said it is like the standard. A lot of people use that on stage, um, but there is a, by AbletonDrummer.com. Toby, he, Toby, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you know Toby. He's a uh, he's a genius, but he created an SPD SX kit selector, so I just automate all the bank changes to happen without me having to change anything on stage. So yeah. That's such a cool one. If you're going to house your samples in the SPD, right? That's a really, really good one to use. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, let me see, I'm just like looking through my live notes right now, seeing if there's anything else. I know there's a yeah. lot of crap in here. <laughs> yeah. I think um, as far as live looping goes, 
uh, for people that want to do that on stage. There is a really cool Max for Live um, device arrangement looper um, that's by AbletonDrummer.com again. Um, he created a device so you can use locators in arrangement view and do live looping like you would in a clip slot in session view. So um, this is another way to, if you do want to perform an arrangement view, then that's another hack. You could do easy live looping over there. Because I know there's ways you can do it with the IAC driver, but that mm -hmm. gets really, yeah. really complicated really quickly. Yeah, yeah, there's some great Max for Live devices that help you avoid that now. Yeah, that's wicked. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. Um, have you ever had any like horror moments with Ableton out live where it's just like completely crashed on you or that's a funny I so I haven't actually had Ableton crash on me but I've had other horror moments using live on stage um, I typically try to run through everything at least two or three times and push everything to the limit before I get on stage to prevent any crashes, especially using Max for Live devices and plugins and things. That's where it can get real weird. Um, but I I do have a story. So there was one time I was on stage with the band and I was using my Akai MPK Mini, a little, little uh, MIDI keyboard. And I mapped to the pads like a start stop and some other functions. And it was in the middle of the drop. It was like the most climatic, most like high energy moment of the entire one hour performance. And everybody was into it. Like people were throwing their beers. It was like a heavy bass drop, right? And it, it was like one of the best crowds I played for. And then next thing, place was packed. Next thing I know, I lean over to trigger um, like this one sample. Long story short, I actually sampled somebody in the crowd and I was playing them back on my keyboard. Um, and I pitched, I pitched. Did you, sorry, did you create that sample at the show live? Yeah, I like jumped into the crowd with a microphone and I was like, yo, just say hey into the microphone, like my hype man or whatever. I was like, give me something. And they're like, yo, and they yelled into the microphone. And I recorded that and I jumped back in. I threw it into a simpler real fast as our keyboardist was playing the intro for the next song that I triggered. And so I literally had like 20 seconds and I practiced it a couple times to make sure I didn't screw it up. Uh, anyway, so I'm playing back his voice on the drop of being like, er, 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 whatever, and uh, and I hit the I hit the I hit the keyboard just hard enough for the other pad on that MIDI controller to trigger, which was the stop button. So I like literally <laughs> the most climactic <laughs> moment, but I, I actually hit it on beat. I hit it on beat, so everybody in the crowd thought it was a break, and they're like. Hey, and then it just never came back. <laughs> it never came back. Oh no! Oh no! And after were, you like session, four, were you in session view um, or arrangement view? I think I was in session view. Maybe. Yeah, so it's, yeah it's it's all over. It, oh god! It wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, it would. Yeah, because well, that and that actually has happened before. I accidentally had stopped the set before, but if you hit um, shift space bar, you actually will start playing exactly where you left off if, if it's session or arrangement view. Um, just as a heads up, because that yeah, wow. that's a thing too. Is... I learned not too long ago. Oh man, that is quality. Yeah, so just shift spacebar will pick up exactly where you left off, no matter where you're playing in live. Um, but yeah, that was crazy. That was a wild moment. And then it was funny because my saxophonist like realizes what it's happened. He's like, "Well, this entire thing is screwed." So then he looks over at me and he runs over and he just starts playing on this like this really cheesy drum sound on the keyboardist drum pad like he had this little <laughs> drum pad <laughs> he just walks over like without missing a beat and just starts playing this little drum beat and then we just made up this like cheesy one <laughs> cheesy one minute song like after the just killing the drop oh man it was that was a memory i'll never forget so yeah to answer yeah, your question that that was it there you go that's one of those oh but, man Looking back at that now, anybody listening, if you're really concerned about any crosstalk, as we would call it, on a MIDI controller, like you trigger one button and it accidentally triggers another, um, one thing you could do to try to get around that is um, using the velocity MIDI effect. There's a gate button on there. And then you could try to gate out certain hits of MIDI being triggered. Um, oh, that's so. clever. 
that would have been a yeah, good fix true. in that scenario. That yeah. would have fixed it. <laughs> that yeah. Been, yeah, well, hindsight, right? Right. We all learn from our mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a, another question about Ableton 11. Yeah. Uh, so I tend not to use Ableton in my studio because it's just, I don't find it as easy to record drums, basically. Really? I have done. Yeah, I have done with with the new Tech Lanes feature. It's it's pretty good. Yeah, but for various reasons, I prefer Logic. I did have a question though: is it is there a, like a keyboard shortcut in Ableton that is tab to tra uh, tab to transient? So you know, in do you, do you know what I mean? Uh, like tab that. to transient. You uh, so what do you mean exactly? In Pro Tools and Logic, there's a key command. I think it's Control comma in logic and it will snap the playhead to the transient so you can get right to the start of the let's say i'm editing a oh, snare drum i can okay. get right to the start of that snare drum huh. and then line stuff up with that it's like super close mm, i don't or i don't add a some yeah oh, okay because that would be nice that would be a nice thing i don't know of a shortcut to do that but that is yeah. a, that is a brilliant shortcut i know how to create like new take lanes <laughs> like i think it's a command option u right yeah um, i think so yeah that's a or that's the show take lanes i guess but yeah there's um there is a really interesting new shortcut i found that if you let me see make sure i'm saying this right if you want to um create like a warp marker before and after something say that you have a clip, an audio clip, and it's warped, and you want to be able to like warp it really quick. <laughs> if you create a warp marker and then hit option, what is it? Option command. Option shift command. It automatically creates a warp, warp marker before and after. Um, so you don't throw off the timing when warping. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, let me, let me double check, fact check that. I know I have it. I just recently did a podcast with 100 Ableton Live tips and workflows um, for anybody listening on the Ableton Music Producer podcast, and I included it in there. I hit up a bunch of certified trainers and asked them to contribute, um, and I created a big Google Sheet with a bunch of Ableton Live hacks and tips and things I didn't even know, um, and I put it in there. You can download it for free, anybody listening, but I put it in there. It's hold command plus click and drag a warp marker in an audio clip. And it automatically creates warp markers to the left and the right. So the timing of the clip is not thrown off. It's not thrown off. Wow, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that yeah. was, where, that's what I was thinking. Where can people go to download that uh, spreadsheet? Yeah. Yeah, if you just go to uh, type in liveproducersonline.com um, and then you click on the blog, you'll see episode 100 is in there. Is or in you there. can okay. just... Or just Google search Ableton Music Producer Podcast and then episode 100 in the show notes, there's a link to that Google sheet. Sweet. Um, but yeah, Plus, to your question, awesome. I don't I don't know of a snap to transient. There might still be. I'd have to have to check that out. Yeah. If you find it, nice. let me know. I will. Because that would be a real game changer. Yeah, it's I'll find out. It's the one thing I haven't found out how to do in Ableton yet. Okay. So. Yeah, I'll search yeah. for you. I'll let you know. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, totally. I'm conscious of taking up too much of your of your time. No, you're fine, so, man. I'm um, I'm just hanging out. <laughs> nice. Um, is there? I'll just give you the space now. Like, where can people find you online or check out, check you out, see what you're up to, follow you on socials or that kind of thing, and then anything to keep an eye out that's coming up for you in the in the near future. Yeah, once again, first of all, I appreciate you having me on the podcast. Um, it's my pleasure, yeah, man. Thank talking. you. Yeah, thanks a lot. I know we've been talking about this for a while. It's good to actually hang out. Um, as far as connecting with me online, I'm mostly on Instagram, um, at Philia Music. That's at P-H-I-L-I-A Music. Um, and then you can also see any of my Ableton training or podcasts and anything like that at liveproducersonline.com. If you go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter, then if you don't mind me sending you emails every week, then you can check that out. And I'll send you podcast episodes of me interviewing people and uh, like free resources and Ableton Live content and training stuff I've made. 
So those are probably the two best places. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. And then anything coming up for you that people should oh, yeah. be ready um, for? I mean, I'm working on an EP and I ambitiously was going to have it out a week ago, but it's still in the works. <laughs> so I'm hoping um, probably late January 2022 is when okay. it's going to drop. So working hard on that EP, producing a lot right now and uh, just doing the podcast thing. That's pretty much it. Nice. Quality. Yeah. Possibly That's moving wicked. to Denver, Colorado. We'll see. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Have, yeah. Have you ever been? No, not to Denver. It's beautiful. I have a friend in, I think he lives in Boulder. Oh, yeah. That's Boulder? not far. Yeah. 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 They, yeah they write, he writes awesome music, actually. Him and his writing partner write some really, really cool stuff. Okay. They're called Ro uh, Rose Room. Rose Room. Um, Rose Room. Is I think it's Rose Room. I really hope I've got that right. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's not too far from Denver. Room. Yeah. He's an amazing keyboard player. Friend of mine. Right yeah, they're, they're cool. But no, I, I've been so, to various places in the States, but yeah. well, in, LA and New York so far. Yeah. Well, so hit me my, up next time I you're will, in the States. Man. Let me know. We'll hang my out. My brother lives in Florida, so I'm hoping to make it over next oh, cool. year, which is it's, not that close to you, I don't think, is it? No, it's about I think like fifteen hours south. That's yeah, that's a little way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good drive. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, where are you at right now? I'm in London. Okay, I thought so. In London, yeah, I yeah, yeah. You were in London. Yeah, cool. so I hope I'm to in make London. It over. Oh yeah, man, definitely. If you're in London, let's meet up and yeah, yeah, that'd be dope. Yeah. I love having friends in other countries. Yeah, man, it's 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 really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's for rad sure. to have. So yeah, cool, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, totally. All right, dude. Yeah, take care, man. Peace out.